who is one of the prime ministers who I think is very underrated. Very. It's very interesting if you go back and can think about the things that he did and the views that he expressed when he was prime minister. He did, in a way, anticipate quite a lot of the Whitlam attitudes. You know, his attitude towards Aborigines, his attitude on international affairs. He was the first prime, conservative prime minister who had any sense of autonomy or uh, uh, as against the British or the Americans. You know. McMahon was a much more limited man. He was never strong enough, he was never sufficiently in charge of his cabinet to be able to do things himself. He, you know, he, I, when I went, agreed to work with him, it was on a, you know, a probably improper understanding that he would change things for Aborigines. And he made some quite good statements promising these things. I can remember a conference that with the state ministers and so on that was held in uh, in Cairns, where he made a very good statement, which was in a sense the to accept differences, to not to go to abandon the assimilation objective. But uh, on the day following those, that Cairns uh, statement, the Minister for the Interior made statements that in the Northern Territory it was not going to be like that at all. Uh, he was a weak man. We will legislate to give Aborigines land rights. Not just because their case is beyond argument, but because all of us as Australians are diminished while the Aborigines are denied their rightful place in this nation. What were your feelings when Whitlam came to power? Well, I think that, uh, like many people, I felt that this could be a beginning of uh, something that was really exceptional. It was an exceptional opportunity. And uh, I, I do really did feel that for the first time since Ben Chifley, uh, we we could we would be having a prime minister who had a vision of Australia as a place in which you could be proud to live. Has Mr. Whitlam agreed to your conditions? That's a question which uh, you should uh, put to Mr. Whitlam. But uh, the, the position has not yet arisen. What I have said is that if Mr. Whitlam, as prime minister, invites me to become an advisor to him, I will give that request serious consideration. Through the course of your life, you served many prime ministers as public servant, banker, advisor. That gave you quite a lot of power, didn't it? Well, I don't, uh, uh, yeah, I don't mind the word influence, <laughs> but uh, I don't, I have never thought of the work that I did as uh, an exercise of power. I, perhaps it Perhaps that well, I was wrong, might have been wrong about that, but I don't think so. I think I had influence. I think I'm a competent persuader, and uh, you know, and I like persuading. What did you see as your greatest achievement during the period that you were in charge of the Council for the Arts? I mean, what do you think it was that really made the difference? Once somebody asked me what I thought was the you know, function of a bureaucrat, you know, in relation to the arts, and I said, well, bureaucrats, a good bureaucrat makes other people's dreams come true. Mm. And, and I think that's, so far as I have an achievement in relation to the arts, it was that not that there's anything of the things that were done for which I was responsible, but there was... The organisation and the way it worked was a way in which other people's you know, dreams of became a reality. Do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about the future generally? Well, I think I feel fundamentally pessimistic because I think uh, uh, that we are not dealing with the fundamental problems of our society. I mean, the, 
I suppose in the most absolute form, yeah, the, the, the difficulties are expressed best if you look at the population issue. You see, the population is increasing and continuing to increase at a fantastic rate. And uh, it is just going to be impossible for the population f as forecast to be fed, clothed and everything. Certainly not, but it's, it's impossible, even if we transformed the way in which our society is run so that we too accepted a lower rate of consumption of resources so that the rest of the world could come closer to the kind of lifestyle that we live, even if all those things were done. I see Malthus 180 or 200 years ago, or whatever it was, said that unless we learn to control the growth of population, it will be imposed on us by famine, pestilence and war. Now, we have them. Famine in very many countries. There's food, they can't afford it. They are starving except for some internationally organised charity. Pestilence, well AIDS is a pretty good in form of pestilence and we have wars all over the world. But even so, despite those things, the population continues to rise and uh, I just don't see any way in which catastrophe can be avoided. But you can't be entirely without hope for the future because you keep on working hard at the causes that you care uh, about. Well, you know, I don't... I, it's... Uh, work is a habit. <laughs> you know, I see, it's... Uh, what would I do if I stopped doing these things? They, uh, uh, I'm here. I've, and... Uh, but you see, uh, expectation of, I've learned to live with the uh, conviction that a uh, lot of your efforts are going to be unsuccessful. And to believe that that's not a good reason for not trying. So it's, it is partly habit. It's uh, as my wife uh, said, you know, that I can't leave things alone, uh, if I think they should be different. Lots of people think the world should be different, but she said about me that I'm just uh, conceited enough to think that I can do something about it. Looking back over your life, what has been your biggest disappointment? Well, I should say, certainly my biggest disappointment is uh, that uh, uh, I... Well, we just have not been prepared to accept the right of Aborigines to be different, to be part of our society and welcome in it, but to preserve differences, cultural and other, which are important to them. I remember <coughs> Whitlam saying that while until we uh, accept Aboriginal rights, and act on that. He says, we are all demeaned. And I feel that that's a truth, that the thing which demeans Australia and Australians more than anything is their failure to act on that issue. What would you say was your greatest achievement? What is something that you feel really proud of? Well, it's... Uh, somebody else asked me this some time ago, and uh, I said, well, uh, I have four children. Uh, they all have... They all are doing in interesting jobs. They... Uh, uh, none of them seriously take drugs other than alcohol. Uh, and they all still talk to me. They don't approve of me, but uh, they still talk to me. 
Now, I think, in a personal sense, that's not a bad achievement. Southeast Asia. Flying to six continents with the largest fleet of aircraft. And now, the first global airline from Southeast Asia. Imagine. Fly Malaysia Airlines. <laughs> Twenty-eight kilowatts of power, a 2.8 liter V6 engine, and not to 107.6 seconds. The electrifying Golf VR6 from Volkswagen. There are over a billion stars in the cosmos. A billion stars drifting through the infinite vastness of space. But there's only one computer that can run Windows, DOS, and Macintosh software. Power Macintosh is here. And the future is better than you expect. During the 80s, the boardrooms of Australia were raided by a bunch of corporate cowboys. As a result, many people suffered. How did they get away with it? Who was responsible? Could it happen again? Trevor Sykes, in his definitive book of business in the 80s, profiles the corporate cowboys, starting with Christopher Scase, in the Weekend Australian and continuing in the Australian all next week. SBS warns viewers that the following program contains material of a distressing nature. This was World War II. And this is how we remember it. On film, black and white motion picture film. And this is the way it really looked. This is the way it looked to those who were there. This is unique color film, the most comprehensive color record of the war in Europe. My father was George Stevens, the film director. He started out as a cameraman, and before the war, he directed films like Alice Adams with Katherine Hepburn, Gunga Din, and Swing Time with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. He left Hollywood in 1942 to serve in the Army Signal Corps, and he was assigned by General Eisenhower to organize the motion picture coverage of the war in Europe. His special coverage unit shot 35-millimeter black-and-white film, 
and much of it became the record by which we remember the war. He also took along his own 16 millimeter camera and some Kodachrome film. With it, he and the men who travel in his Jeep shot a kind of personal diary. And from time to time, he sent the film home in these boxes to our house near Toluca Lake in North Hollywood. After the war, the color film ended up in a storeroom. Where my father kept the things that were important to him. For decades, these boxes of film remained there, unexamined, until after his death. You were about to see the war as my father and his colleagues saw it, and hear their recollections of those times when each day was an adventure and hopes for the world ran high. We begin in London in 1944, where he assembled the team, which came to be known as the Stevens Irregulars. These are men who are way past military age, who were all rather pacifistic. Not pacifistic when it came to dealing with studio heads or perhaps in a brawl in a, in a nightclub, but all the very liberal men who, one and all, they gave up very lucrative and very prestigious careers and went right in into the army. As D-Day approached, Lieutenant Colonel Stevens had beside him a team of professionals. The special coverage unit of the Allied Expeditionary Force. Among them, William Saroyan, the playwright. Holly Morse, assistant director from the Roach Studios. Bill Hamilton, sound man from Columbia Studios. Novelist, screenwriter, Erwin Shaw. Writer, Ivan Moffat. And cameramen, Ken Marthy, Jack Muth, Dick Kent, and William Meller. On D-Day, they would fan out among the Allied armies to cover the greatest seaborne invasion in history. In the dawn of the 6th of June, 1944, the armada of the Allied nations set forth across the English Channel and drew near the heavily fortified beaches of occupied France. With the same camera that he used for home movies on Gunga Din, my father began his color film diary. The flagship Belfast was designated to fire the first volley of the invasion. He saw the captain read to his men assembled on the deck from Shakespeare, Henry V. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today who sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. D-Day, landing time for the first beachhead boats. Now Signal Corps cameras catch the full drama of the fateful hour. The Allies had the advantage of surprise and put ashore 176,000 men in the first 24 hours. But the German resistance was fierce, and the Allies could not gain momentum. It became clear that long days and months of hard fighting lay ahead. It was the job of the special coverage unit to record what they saw. able to move anywhere in the war under special orders. But we were right at frontline action all the time. If things got too heavy, George would say, I think we ought to get out of here. <laughs> George uh, felt very strong about the war. He knew what it knew what his mission was, he knew what the war was about, and, and he was very dedicated to 
the, the, the best motion picture coverage of this, of this tremendous event. The special coverage unit operated from a base camp between the two American beaches, Utah and Omaha, which were pumping men and material directly into combat. The overwhelming impression was of this extraordinary logistical power coming at thousands and thousands and thousands of ships and hundreds and thousands of tons of material being unlanded 24 hours a day pouring inland through every lane across every road in that beachhead and it was it was a it was a sight that you would never you would never dreamt of ever seeing i mean if there is victory which of course we assume there would be this is what victory is going to be made of this amazing accumulation of stuff these were the, the truly the sinews of war The Stevens Irregulars dug in and set up their base of operations near the town of Carenton in a field one and a half kilometers from the German lines. And now, Captain Glenn Miller. Thank you, Lieutenant Don Briggs, and good evening, everybody been a big week for our side. Over on the beaches of Normandy, our boys have fired the opening guns of the long-awaited drive to liberate the world. Now to get to a little music, here are the boys with their rocket gun version of Flying Home. sign, a famous sign up there that started off as uh, New York and Paris on it and gradually more and more was added on until finally at the bottom it was Shirley 4,200 miles or something like that. Now Shirley was one of the boys' girlfriends and I believe it was Chicago but I couldn't be sure. highly professional uh, and we'd all all been in the motion picture business for some time and we'd all made many many motion pictures and we felt a little more qualified than some of the signal for core cameramen and we had a uh, cameraman like uh, William Meller who who was an Academy Award winner uh, Joe Byrock who is currently filming all the great shows of today we were all experts in our field Four weeks after D-Day, they were summoned to a July 4th meeting of the High Command. British General Bernard Law Montgomery, Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Land Forces. General Omar Bradley, Commander of the American First Army, were there to decorate heroes of the invasion. General George Patton with his pearl-handled revolver. Privately, the generals were worried about the Normandy campaign, fearing a stalemate on the narrow beachhead. But publicly, Montgomery radiated confidence. The pace has been hot, and it was clear that someone would have to give ground sooner or later. It was equally clear that the Allied soldiers would see the thing through to the end and would never give up. And so the Germans have been forced to give ground, which is very right and proper. And today, the Allied armies fighting in Normandy have good grounds for solid satisfaction. Well done. Well done indeed. Even as their army pulled back, the German landmines made the Allied advance dangerous. The 
the smell of death, uh, I still smell uh, once in a while at night. I wake up screaming in the middle of the night. The, the devastation was so extreme that it, it'll ne I'll never outlive it. George had an extraordinary sense of uh, visualizing events and, and scenes. But these visual horrors and paradoxes uh, gave him a great deal of insight into things that he'd never dreamt of before. In an attempt to break out beyond their bridgehead, the Allies launched a massive air attack on the entrenched German garrison. Wave after wave of bombers came in, and they were dropping their, their bombs on one particular little, little place, San Lo. And, and the concussion was just terrible. And this, this push went on for hours and hours, plane after plane. The skies were full of bombers coming over everywhere you looked and dropping rows of bombs just the head of where we were to clear out that area of Germans. After weeks of bombardment and ground assault, the mighty German force had cracked. And for the Americans, this was their first look at the enemy. You'd pick Germans out of foxholes and things like that who were, were, were just absolutely uh, devastated by what had happened. They couldn't believe that. And, and they were just out of their minds. They, they, I'm sure it took them a long time to get back to reality. This curious, unmistakable smell of leather and sweat. Now, the Germans used a great deal of leather in their equipment. Then there was a smell of some unwashed uniforms, and a peculiar smell one got used to, and came to recognize whatever they had been among the prisoners of war. Two hundred thousand German prisoners were herded to the rear while the Allies raced forward. Where before, in the gritty battles in the hedgerows of Normandy, they measured a day's progress in yards, now, as liberators, they measured each day's advance in miles. the Allied armies were in competition, each hoping to be the first to Paris. 
my father decided to try to join the French armored division commanded by General Philippe Leclerc. When he wanted to get around authority, he knew how to do it, usually just by remaining quiet. And he did that, I know, in Hollywood. And I think he did the same thing in the army. He was not a rebel, but he knew what he wanted, and he knew how to get it. Authority granted, they joined Leclerc's forces to photograph the liberation of Paris. The 2nd French Armored Division entered the outskirts of the city at dawn on the 25th of August. And the Stevens Irregulars were with them. The atmosphere was sort of halfway between a carnival and a, and a bullfight. All the purpose of a war seemed to be coming true before your eyes. George went right to the top. He went with the uh, German command, the guard Montparnasse. He filmed the taking of the surrender by uh, General Leclerc. Paris free again, and the beginning of the last act in its amazing story. The surrender of Lieutenant General von Choltitz, German commander of the Paris region. At a dingy office in Montparnasse station, formal end of German rule. Despite the surrender, sniper fire continued in the streets. I think I ended up under a jeep. But Stevens was standing alone out in front. He looked down at me and said, uh, you can't make any pictures from down there, you know. This is where the action is. <laughs> to achieve a ceasefire, captured German officers were dispatched across the city under white flags of truce to spread word of the surrender. Ivan Moffat spoke German and was detailed to escort one German officer. We drove off with some difficulty through this enormous, angry, ferocious, rejoicing crowd which was in the Place de Rennes below. And he was spat at, and I, we were all drenched in spit. I had to sort of reassure him a bit. He wasn't going to be sort of lynched or something. I remember my father saying that August the 25th, 1944, was the greatest day of his life. Americans turned a Bailey Bridge on its side to make a reviewing stand. General Bradley invited General de Gaulle 
to take the salute as the 28th Division marched down the Champs-Élysées. intoxicated and one said at the time that no matter what would happen afterwards nothing could exceed nothing would ever exceed the emotional experience of the 25th war of 1944 and nothing did Once the 28th Division passed the reviewing stand, they moved out of Paris to rejoin the American offensive. That day, Erwin Shaw bet my father that the war would be over by October. But ahead was the coldest winter in 20 years, and history to be recorded. believed the enemy was weakening. But Hitler ordered the German army to counterattack. In what became known as the Battle of the Bulge, 200,000 German troops attacked the American positions. Americans prevailed, but suffered 68,000 casualties. The Belgian countryside was devastated. were destined to spend one more Christmas away from home. As winter turned into spring, the Allies were once again fighting their way forward, moving into Germany. Allied objective was to cross the Rhine River. They mounted a massive air attack, 
sending 22,000 paratroopers in gliders to drop over the Rhine into Germany. The American First Army attacked on the ground, successfully crossing the Rhine and moving deeper into Germany. On the 11th of April, the Special Coverage Unit came upon one of Germany's greatest and most secret installations. They found the largest underground factory in the world at Nordhausen. 40 miles of tunnels and passages. This was Nordhausen's product, the V-1 flying bomb. 8,000 of these terror weapons had been launched and rained destruction on England. These liquid fuel engines powered the new V-2 rocket upon which Hitler was placing his last hopes for victory. And here, the Germans had developed the Messerschmitt 216, the world's first jet interceptor. These achievements of science were the product of slave labor. Czechs, Poles, Russians, Frenchmen, Belgians, and Italians forced to work underground. Ken and I walked through one of the barracks. There was a man lying in a bed with another, two men in a bunk. And we said we were Americans, and this one man was very happy with a weak, sick face. And we interviewed some of the people there. And when we came back, that man had rolled over and died. A week after leaving Nordhausen, they photographed the largest surrender of World War II. German Army Group B had been encircled and gave up 320,000 prisoners, including 25 generals. extraordinary um, to see them all suddenly. Masses and masses, some of them admirals, generals, even a few marshals, uh, privates, everybody all corralled there together. It was an odd feeling that uh, of all this enormous power, having laid down its arms and standing there before us, feeling this formidable machine was there just like a whole mass of sheep in the field, and they're defenseless and unarmed, ready to do our bidding. It was very heightened by the sense, of course, that the Germans were probably a more professional and better trained army, really, than we were. And there they all were, sort of, before us. Now the Allies drove eastward, and the special coverage unit set its sights on being in the right place to cover the link-up between the Americans and the Russian army that was approaching from the east. They headed for Torgau on the Elbe River. 
This is Frank Gillard at General Bradley's headquarters. East and West have met. At 20 minutes to 5 on Wednesday afternoon, April the 25th, 1945, American troops of General Bradley's 12th Army Group made contact with Soviet elements of Marshal Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Army Group near the German town of Torgau on the Elbe. Their journeys had started a world apart, yet the Stevens Irregulars and their Russian counterparts seemed like old friends. orders to move south through Germany to Bavaria. At the Dachau concentration camp, what they saw and recorded would not soon be forgotten. This is a 20-year-old young man with a sheltered life behind him. It was a terrible shock. How can one human being do this to another human being? Impossible to think of. How does one justify this mass murder? You just want to hate the Germans. You want to hate all Germans at this time. Some German guards had disguised themselves in the striped uniforms of the prisoners. Working with recently freed inmates, the liberators sought to identify the Germans. One hundred and twenty-two SS guards were shot. Others were beaten to death by enraged inmates. An epidemic struck the camp and the freed prisoners were sprayed with DDT to prevent further deaths. After years of horror and degradation, the time had come for Dachau's first religious service.
On May 8th, 10 days after the liberation of Dachau, came the news that the world had long awaited. Good morning from the White House in Washington. The President of the United States. The Western world has been freed of the evil forces which for five years and longer have imprisoned the bodies and broken the lives of millions upon millions of freeborn men. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. A million and a half men had been held as prisoners of war in Germany. Now, warriors from many allied nations were free, and they were going home. As spring came to Europe in 1945, it seemed the entire continent was on the move. The whole of Europe was like some enormous crossroads, um, dusty crossroads, dust from all the vehicles churning up the roads. And in the green of the spring, there was this dust and this constant, constant stream of all the men of Europe going home, mostly on foot, pushing perambulators and carts. Norwegians going north, Italians going south, Belgians and French going west, um, people going back to Russia and Poland. And everywhere, people passing each other on these endless, endless crossroads of Europe. The fighting over, my father's curiosity drew him east to the Bavarian Alps, to Berchtesgaden. There they would inspect Hitler's mountain hideaway with its tea rooms and terraces and its famous picture window. I captured most of Hitler's dinnerware up there and uh, I took it back to Paris and traded it for cognac. So an awful lot of Hitler's dinnerware is around Paris somewhere. Finally, they received clearance from the Russians to go to Berlin. The German capital had been liberated by the Russian army. And Stalin had made it clear that the Soviet Union would not be dislodged from Berlin or Eastern Germany. The Russians were very systematic about cleaning up the city. Like they'd take a block and, and somebody who wasn't a true Nazi, they'd made him the boss and uh, they'd form endless lines and they'd take these bricks and pass them one to the other and that's the way they cleaned up. They were absolutely beaten. Most of them were wandering around in days. They were more afraid of the Russians than they were of the Allies. Now, Berlin was divided into Soviet, British, French, and American occupation zones. The fragile Allied unity had come to an end, and the Cold War was about to begin. The Stevens Irregulars were coming to the end of their time as soldiers. Their last days were spent viewing the remnants of the Third Reich. The Reich's chancellery, where Hitler plotted his war. And the trench where his and his mistress Eva Braun's bodies were burned.
They saw the stadium where in 1936, Hitler first found the world spotlight and a platform for his idea of a master race. Their work was done. They had recorded history. Now their thoughts turned to home, to their families, and to resuming their careers as filmmakers and storytellers. Each of the Stevens Irregulars was affected by the war, and for many of them, their war experience would color their work. In 1948, Irwin Shaw published the acclaimed World War II novel, The Young Lions. Captain Joe Byrock returned to Hollywood and photographed the film classic, It's a Wonderful Life. Ivan Moffat wrote screenplays for Tender is the Night and Giant. William Meller won Academy Awards as Director of Photography for A Place in the Sun and The Diary of Anne Frank. George Stevens turned from comedies, musicals, and adventure to create American classics like A Place in the Sun, Shane, Giant, and The Diary of Anne Frank. Ivan Moffat told me of the day in May 1945 when they left the concentration camp at Dachau. My father asked the driver to stop the jeep by a building on the edge of the camp. It was the post office where all mail had come and gone for so many painful years. He disappeared inside and came back ten minutes later and they drove off in silence. After a time, Ivan asked, why did you go in there? Dad reached in his pocket and handed this to him. It is the stamp that was used to mark the letters in the Dachau post office. The adjustable date still shows April the 29th, 1945, the day the Allies liberated the camp and the day the atrocities stopped forever. These were the men of the special coverage unit of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This is their story as they recorded it and as it will live on film. Missing an SBS. Washington today leads the nation in so many appalling ways. The murder capital of the country with a homicide rate that defies all political attempts to police the city. Drug addiction rising in Washington while in some other cities it's falling in the face of the federal government's war against drugs. Here, not very far from the White House, drug peddlers selling openly out on the streets. 
and then the homeless. In all these areas, Marion Barry is remembered as a man who raised money and spent it on assistance. We intend to make the government work for the people, to attract businesses into Washington, work on getting the guns off the streets in Washington, D.C. And what's so striking is the way in which his politics of redemption is playing. You hear it at his meetings. Well, the past, you know, we all make mistakes, like he said, you know, I'm a recovering alcoholic of 10 years, and I've had no problem being that. And I can believe he can be, too. You hear it out on the streets. What it says to me is that uh, the man made a mistake. He paid his dues, and we can forgive him. Are you surprised at the way that people seem to have forgiven and forgotten? Well, I think America has a redemptive and forgiving spirit. Uh, we are sort of an underdog kind of, kind of country, and they believe that it's all right to forgive. It's Marion Barry practicing the politics of forgiveness. He's finding that many out there positively empathize with the public and private rehabilitation he's lived through. David Smith on Marion Barry's remarkable comeback. Time for a look at tomorrow's weather now with tonight's satellite map of Australia. Adelaide mainly fine 7 to 17, Brisbane dry 9 to 24, Canberra fine 0 to 16, Darwin mainly fine 21 to 32, Hobart Corvish showers 5 to 11, Melbourne showers 7 to 15, Perth late thundery showers 10 to 27, Sydney sunny 10 to 19. And that's the weather around the country. I'm Paul Murphy and we'll be back with more reports from home and abroad on News Extra tomorrow night. See you then. two-part series exploring the origins and the aftermath of the Gulf War. Acts of War, next on SBS. Friday night, there are two cult movies to choose from, starting at 9.30 with The Tune. You dunderhead. A surreal animated adventure from award-winning director Bill Plimpton. Then at 10.40, a voyeur's delight. She knows it's there, but he doesn't. She's a film student. So for her, this is homework. It's like peeping through a keyhole. Double-barreled cult. The tune at 9.30. Homework at 10.40 on Friday night. Now here she is, the star of this week's show, Patsy Cline. On Saturday at 8.30, we remember Patsy Cline. Stupid Cupid, you're a real mean guy. I'd like to get you so you can she had a type of soul that is hard to find in a singer. To me, she was a, a, a musician uh, first. I mean, she would she act like a musician, talk like a musician, and travel like a musician. A celebration of the life of Patsy Cline. Remembering Patsy, 8.30 Saturday. your house look absolutely beautiful get a copy of this if you want to make your house look absolutely beautiful without spending a lot of money get a copy of this freedom furniture's hot new 68 page catalog in store now it's been test driven on the roads of switzerland italy and germany by over 15 million people europe's number one the new two liter golf gl from volkswagen Persian Gulf on fire, 40% of world oil supply at risk. 
half a million U.S. troops rushed to an alien desert arena. Air war of unprecedented ferocity. Awesome. Mesmerizing. Terrifying. Effectively, a world war. 30 nations against one in a U.S.-led United Nations coalition. Acts of war. The origin. The Iran-Iraq war, it rages for eight years, a measure of Saddam's fanaticism. He takes half a million casualties, but as it ends, so does the Cold War. Saddam senses a superpower vacuum. He begins to probe, pressing old border claims against Kuwait. Grievances understood at the CIA. Uh, he clearly wanted uh, control of the oil fields that he felt were his or where the oil was being stolen, in his view, by slant drilling from the Kuwaitis in a disputed border area. Uh, he wanted access to the ocean through uh, the islands that he claimed. If he had taken those, he could take those very quickly. The threats build. Only two months before he invades Kuwait, Saddam hosts the Arab League. He had fought Iran for all of them, he says. Now, with his own oil reserves, the second largest squandered, he demands huge compensation. Egypt's president. He already taken over $60 billion from the Gulf countries during the Iran-Iraq war. And they were helping him a lot. It, it seemed as if uh, it was a minefield and, and, and people had to be weary of where they, they stepped. I think that, for example, Kuwait uh, provoked Iraq quite a bit prior to, to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the invasion itself. Mid-July, U.S. satellite intelligence reveals a massive deployment of Iraqi troops near the Kuwait border. The CIA monitors this. We could see the, the gathering of, of armor on the ground, the, the movement of military units uh, into attack formation. One time, there were 35,000 troops massed on the border. Then there were 70,000. Then 100,000. It's a very open threat, building day by day for a full two weeks. Officially, the U.S. stays silent. No counter move, no caution. And now the Arabs are saying not to worry. Egypt's President Mubarak is directly reassured by Saddam. I decided to go immediately to the meet with Saddam Hussein. Then I asked him a direct question. What about the news that there are concentration of Iraqi forces on the Kuwaiti border? Is this right? And uh, then he told me, oh, my friend, it's no problem there. One week before Saddam invades, he abruptly summons U.S. Ambassador April Glaspie, who tells him the U.S. holds no opinion about your border disagreement with Kuwait. She then goes on vacation. Yet the Pentagon is now very alarmed. Under Secretary Paul Wolfowitz discloses the warning he gave. There's so much force there, and it's so far committed that there's a significant likelihood he's going to use it. Magnitude of this task. The military dilemma. Only Saudi Arabia can provide the land base for an effective counter-strike. They approach the Saudi ambassador, Prince Bandar, but he's unconvinced. And there was a sense that maybe the Americans are a little bit exaggerating it, so that they will then be asked to come in or establish, quote-unquote, presence in the region. The dilemma for Bush. Saudi cooperation is likely only if Saddam occupies Kuwait. As if sure of U.S. reaction, the Kuwaitis seem strangely unconcerned. The Kuwaitis still had the same position. That, no, let's not exaggerate this. Uh, they had an answer that, uh, well, if he wants to invade, let him invade. He will be uh, uh, pushed out. The invasion eve, Saddam visits the front. For two weeks, he has hesitated. How far to go? 
From Washington, silence. Even after the CIA director warns of imminent invasion. We did so uh, several hours before the invasion occurred and predicted it within 12 to 24 hours. The warning is rooted by National Security Council member Richard Haas to his chief, advisor Brent Scowcroft, dramatically. And he said, well, let's go see the president about it. And while the three of us were talking, the phone rang. We had just heard from our embassy in Kuwait that shots were being heard and some kind of war had just begun. Some kind of war, but what exactly? We didn't know whether you just had some isolated shooting, whether you had the Iraqis maybe moving a couple of meters into Kuwait. We had no idea of the extent of what was going on. Hours into the invasion, Saddam calls Jordan's King Hussein, requesting an Arab summit within 48 hours, saying, We have gone in, but this is temporary. Uh, and we're willing to withdraw, uh, provided uh, we can resolve this problem once and for all within the Arab context. Then uh, George Bush phoned us. I told him, give us 24 hours or 48 hours. We may find a good solution. So the feeling was, OK, we'll give people their 48 hours. Quite honestly, there wasn't a lot we could do yet. Uh, you can't suddenly start up the American military machine as though you're flicking on a light switch. For a few crucial hours, both Bush and Saddam seem to wait on each other. Saddam is still not warned. Bush makes his first statement on the crisis, saying he won't discuss military options, but is not contemplating any. Then he leaves for Aspen, Colorado, to meet Britain's visiting Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. She brings her senior advisor on foreign policy, Sir Charles Pohl. There was an immediate meeting of minds, that's my firm recollection. What Saddam Hussein had done was totally unacceptable. It couldn't be allowed to stand to use two of the phrases which they both used. Feeling betrayed, Bush and Margaret Thatcher do not wait on an Arab solution. They begin forging a coalition of nations built on their personal contacts. There we were, stuck in a very attractive ranch high up in the mountains in Colorado. Um, a tiny staff of people uh, trying to reach world leaders by telephone. It was a somewhat curious setup, but it worked very well. As they meet, Saddam's forces never seriously warned off, occupy Kuwait City, and systematically sack it. By this act, Saddam defies and mocks the major powers who have aided and armed him. What are we going to do? What's our uh, position in such a bad situation? Really, I was in a, in a mess from the people themselves. Mubarak also cannot forgive Saddam's betrayal. He invaded the country. There was no reason. He bluffed me, so I cannot support him if he gives him 100 billion. Bush summons his inner circle. A small group, they avoid dissent. Paul Wolfowitz recalls how the president guides them and surprises them. We have to discuss the options, but let's understand one thing, that what has happened is unacceptable. We, that seemed to kind of set a tone. The president, after all, was clearly uh, quite a bit ahead of all the rest of us. At the first meeting, no firm decisions of any kind. There might not even be a crisis. At the second meeting, a day later, the crisis becomes all-consuming. I think everybody had a sense that we were wrestling with a, a absolutely extraordinary crisis, one of the major events of the decade. He did not ask for policy records. He asked very searching questions, uh, and he, in the end, he made his own judgments. With Kuwait's emir safe in Saudi Arabia, the urgency is Saudi oil, 20% of world reserves. In checking Saddam, Kuwait is a sacrificial pawn, its ambassador admits. If he'd gone to Saudi Arabia, I think, the, the whole focus would have been on, on Saudi Arabia rather than on Kuwait, and Kuwait would have, would have been like a bargaining chip in the whole thing. And uh, I was praying that night that he would stop there in Kuwait. Uh, we lacked the means to help Kuwait, even if the will were there. Uh, we had to have a place to put our troops, and until Saudi Arabia was involved, 
We did not have that capability. The American side was saying, ask us for help, then we'll tell you what we will do. Prince Bandar becomes the key intermediary with Saudi King Fahd. The U.S. wants to send a deterrent force immediately, but Fahd has two major concerns. There's the huge social risk of having foreign troops in the Holy Land, and there's the risk of U.S. staying power, American resolve. There comes an extraordinary moment when Bush tells Bandar, I give you my word that if you ask for help, and we, we will come to help you as good friends, and I will go with you all the way. All the way. The President of the United States has given his word of honor in private. Publicly, nothing has been said. The Pentagon chiefs hasten to Riyadh, persuading King Fahd that Saddam is about to invade. Agreement comes in a mere hundred words. Prince Bandar is there. A simple agreement, however, with the Americans, that American uh, lawyers did not like very much uh, simply because it was half a page agreement. It has three conditions. Friendly forces would be invited. They would leave whenever Saudi Arabia requested. They would respect Saudi traditions. Three lines, we signed it, and every country that sent troops to Saudi Arabia had to sign the same agreement. Those in favor of the draft resolution. At the United Nations, the emphasis is on sanctions. The UN approves a naval blockade of Iraq, but at the White House, Bush orders carte blanche for any troop needs. John Sununu, then chief of staff. Uh, it eventually got to be uh, more than 250,000, but that's just that sequence of, of, the, of their response to the president saying, make sure that if we are going to do this, we do this absolutely right. Though the scenario is open-ended, Bush only announces a defensive force of 10,000 troops. Within days, warships from Canada, Australia, and Europe prepare for the Gulf. Despite different agendas, it's an extraordinary expression of international will. So, the battle lines are drawn led by two crusading personalities, both with a strong sense of national mission, both haunted with the ghosts of lost wars, otherwise so very different. Bush, a maestro of global diplomacy. Saddam, a self-appointed general who seldom leaves his country, never visits the West. Two leaders constantly heard, but never in contact. It dismays Arab Americans who see Saddam encouraged. I think he was, he was operating on a collision course from the beginning. I think we were operating on a collision course from the beginning, and we both got, apparently, what we wanted. Two leaders who have never met, never conversed, but whose defining moments are now to violently intersect. For George Bush, demonstrative patriotism is part of his American roots, dating back 350 years. From his father, a U.S. senator and Wall Street banker, he acquires an ever-burning need to compete and lead. At Yale, he's team captain. 1942, on his 18th birthday, he volunteers for war, becoming the Navy's youngest pilot. After 58 missions, he's shot down, his two crewmates killed. Floating at sea, he's saved by an American sub, a moment his rescuers photograph. A moment that politicizes Bush, says school friend Thomas Ashley. I think that we all came out of World War II with some very fixed views of, of geopolitics. He's 21 when he marries, an oil millionaire by his 30s. His partnership, Zapata Oil, makes Middle East history. It drills Kuwait's first offshore well. Says a friend, in the mirror, Bush sees a Texas wildcat. But over the years, the privileged image persists, the chauffeured college boy playing on. Bush is, is very deceptive because uh, he is he's so, uh, so nice and, and gentlemanly. But uh, 
don't, uh, don't ever try to beat him. He runs hard. Member of Congress, ambassador to the United Nations, director of the CIA, vice president. He calls himself mission-oriented, yet remains a shadowy figure. Time Magazine's 1990 Man of the Year presents two faces of Bush. Managing editor Henry Muller. And so we did settle on what first seemed like a joke, but what in the end seemed like a very pointed way of saying something to our readers about George Bush. Uh, the one on the left uh, looks more like an inspiring leader, uh, looks more like a visionary. And the one on the right, which is a little more downcast, more of the wimp, more of the, the man who likes leadership. And that there is no place for lawless aggression in the Persian Gulf. His response to Saddam's provocation was so uncharacteristically strong. Dealing with Hitler revisited. We cannot talk about compromise. When he was acting out of a deeply held conviction of his own that, um, he was the guy, he was the white hat fighting the black hat here. The black hat sells. Targeting Saddam rather than Iraq helps his Arab enemies. Arab commentator Ragida Dergan. So the war was built as a war against Saddam. And this is the personal element. Saddam Hussein had wanted Iraqis to know him as Saddam. It's um, like uh, the emirs and the kings are known with their first names. Saddam, say his critics, forces his own identity on Iraq, even creating his own museum. Though he comes from a peasant background, he presents himself as part warrior, part prophet, his lineage linked to Muhammad. Restoring Babylon's ancient walls, he has the bricks inscribed rebuilt in the time of Saddam Hussein. Saddam draws his power from the past, says British historian Philip Knightley. They see it as yesterday. I mean, it's passed from father to son. It becomes part of the folklore. They feel they've been badly done by the West. For centuries, the ties of Islam keep the Arab tribes under Turkish rule until rival powers, Britain and France, entice revolt. As a reward for this, they would be guaranteed their final independence. And these promises were incorporated in many a treaty. Instead, in the redrawn map after World War I, new puppet states are created. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Jordan. Iraq becomes an arbitrary merging of three distinct cultures, Kurds and rival Sunni and Shiite Muslims. It brings years of revolt and brutal repression. In Baghdad in the 50s, life is a series of coups. Outside influences, the US and European oil cartels continue in direct control. Oil rich, but poor, Iraq's climate of extremes brings the rise of the Ba'at party. It is socialist, secular, pan-Arab. In 1959, as a student activist, Saddam is wounded in an abortive coup, an event he later has reenacted. He flees to Egypt for three years. Later, in jail in Iraq, he reads Stalin and Hitler on the use of terror to gain power. Saddam Hussein is, put simply, a thug. He's not a nice guy. Uh, if you met him, you would be very wary of him. But you would, I believe, also be captivated by him. Uh, he looks you very keenly in the eye, gives out an air of intelligence and shrewdness. But one of his greatest achievements, to my mind, has, made, has been to make education a priority in Iraq, to develop his country and remove some of the, the social divisions within the country. Saddam achieves major reforms, notably for women, but succumbs to megalomania. Iraqis have 200 songs about their president, prime minister, commander-in-chief. He's not known for what he's done to his own people. He's known as the guy who stood in the face of the West and George Bush and said, for all the centuries of what you've done to us, I'm going to say no. Saddam Hussein. The name means 
he who confronts. With 350,000 troops in Kuwait, Saddam could seize Saudi Arabia, could effectively control the Western economies. Oil dependency speeds the coming war. British political scientist Fred Halliday. One could say that uh, cheap and reliable oil is as important to democracy in the late 20th century as cheap and reliable wheat was at the end of the 19th century. Without it, you aren't going to have a functioning political system. The stakes are huge with only a token US force in Saudi Arabia. The coalition force hinges on wider Arab participation, on under-the-table inducements. Syria's president, Hafez al-Assad, had been shunned for supporting international terrorism and for siding with Iran. Now Bush offers diplomatic pardon. Foreign policy specialist, William Quant. Uh, Assad had backed Iran. He was in the doghouse in, in the Arab world for having done so. All of a sudden, Assad turned the tables on Saddam and said, gotcha. For Egypt's Mubarak, Bush offers a huge economic incentive. Bush wiped out $7 billion of military debt like that, and Congress amazingly went along with it. Cairo. After days of hesitation, 12 nations of the Arab League commit to troops to defend Saudi Arabia. Bush's Rolodex diplomacy has prevailed. He now has his coalition and a new crisis. Saddam calls them guests. 13,000 foreign hostages, including women and children. The drama instantly enlarges, becoming a kind of surreal television serial. Does Stuart get his milk? And if there was one incident, which I think in British terms uh, consolidated uh, the whole of British public opinion in their support, it was the occasion when Saddam Hussein was seen with a young British boy. Uh, patronizing him in the most disgusting way. Stuart, for instance, Stuart, uh, well, I'm sure. Though the anti-war movement is set back by the hostage affair, much of the Western public still supports sanctions, not force. Now, a measure of the stakes, 50 warships from a dozen Atlantic nations blockade the Gulf. Every boarding brings risk of a firefight, a missile attack, a total showdown. Week by week, the blockade tightens, but the military momentum cannot wait on sanctions. In human terms, the oil squeeze is already tragic as third world workers driven out of Kuwait and Iraq besiege neighboring Jordan, desperate for shelter and food. Jordan's Queen Noor. We had been caught up in a um, game of nations. Over 800,000 evacuees, as we called them, who poured into our borders, camped out in the desert and in makeshift shelters, many with nothing at all. American-born Queen Noor, an urban planner before she marries King Hussein, helps supervise the camps. Their economy wrecked, Jordan's king and queen, once close friends of George Bush, find themselves outcasts. That attitude came into play very quickly. If you're not with us, you're against us, and there's no middle ground. The test of wills escalates. Saddam repeatedly visits his hostages, drawing out the television drama of the guests he now calls human shields, most of them Europeans and Americans. The leadership language becomes extreme. Author Christine Helms has met Saddam. Being called demon or being called Hitler by Bush, I think told uh, Saddam just one thing that was very important to him and, th and that was it gave him the flavor, the tenor of what was going to happen. And I believe that that uh, probably hardened his, uh, his decision. 
Though Saddam releases the women and children, the gulf is now something more. It's not just a gap, it's a widening abyss on a day-to-day -day basis. One by one, Western embassies in Kuwait are starved into closing. It persuades France to dispatch troops, and the U.S. sends another 100,000. By Thanksgiving, Bush inspects a desert force that has grown in just three months from 10,000 to 230,000 troops. Bush, in his mind, is resolved. Until our mission is done, until the invader is out of Kuwait. Kuwait's emir calls on the U.S. president, bringing a gift of a clock etched with the map of Kuwait. The emir points to the map, saying, this is what I want. The uh, president turned around to him in a very uh, strong, uh, expressive way. He said, that's what you're going to get. The day before the U.S. relinquishes the chair, the U.N. Security Council approves a resolution co-sponsored by Canada. It authorizes the use of all necessary means should Iraq not withdraw from Kuwait within six weeks, by January the 15th. With the fear of war comes a deeper fear. What kind of war it might be. Privately, the coalition leaders anticipate a very bloody war. When Saddam Hussein withdraws totally... In Britain, John Major becomes prime minister, but doesn't waver, though he fears heavy loss of life. His foreign policy advisor, Sir Charles Pohl. It could have been hundreds, thousands even, of British and other Allied soldiers uh, but he, he persuaded people this was the right cause. Washington, late December. Bush and Major agree Saddam isn't backing off. Bush flatly says there has to be war. My recollection is that most of that discussion was about the imperative need to use military means to evict Iraq and trying to choose a date when it would be right to start. As much as Saddam, says the British commander, the enemy is time. We knew we were going to be ready to go to war uh, when we did, uh, but would we actually get that far? Would he allow us to get that far? Or would he give a concession to the United Nations which would unfold the whole thing? Saddam begins releasing the hostages handful by handful, personally saying goodbye, keeping himself center stage as world dignitaries come pleading for their brethren. Visiting Kuwait, Saddam makes a traditional good luck offering of salt, while in a thousand small towns across America, yellow ribbons number the lives to be committed. Only two weeks before their president must decide. Those of us who saw him every day could see that he was thinking about this now almost constantly. But I'm convinced that he did what he did out of conviction that it was right, because he took a very large risk and I think he understood the risks. I think he understood that his whole reputation in history, maybe his, his office, if he failed in this, he could face impeachment. I, I, not to mention the risks of having a military disaster around your neck. Six days to go. One moment of hope remains. In Geneva, the Americans and Iraqis finally meet face to face. A letter from Bush to Saddam is delivered, but left unaccepted. Richard Haas, drafts the letter. It was largely a message of firmness, which is you had better contemplate the abyss into which you were about to plunge you and your nation. At the last moment, Congress ratifies the use of force. But January 14th, eve of the UN ultimatum, Iraq's National Assembly votes unanimously against withdrawal from Kuwait. The deputies chant, long live Saddam. The UN deadline is to expire at midnight. In the distant desert waters, a million soldiers wait. In the long build-up of armor and emotions, only hours remain. The president of Egypt. And I tried with Saddam Hussein sincerely, not for the propaganda, 32 times messages written, oral, through the media, through the television, asking, please, 
32 appeals from one head of state to another, unanswered. And now the eve of war, the last prayer. Jordan's King Hussein is concerned. I was concerned for the human losses, for the, the blood that would flow, for the bones that would be broken, for the, the relations that would leave this region in tatters. A new age of war, high-tech war, begins. Each side with its concept of victory. Operation Desert Storm forces were engaging targets in Kuwait and Iraq. It is war on schedule. It begins with the air war, the scale of it unprecedented. President Bush has set the objective unequivocally. Commander of the air war, General Charles Horner, on his orders. We have to bring force to bear, then bring it to bear in such a way and of such magnitude that it is over with quickly. Smart weapons originally designed to combat the Soviets render the outcome inevitable. It is only a question of losses. The British field commander, Sir Peter de la Billière, on the preparations. You set this great machine up, spend six months working at it, uh, and then you suddenly uh, lift at the starting gate uh, uh, and it's off. If there'd been heavy losses, then <clears throat> we would know that uh, we'd perhaps not gained the initiative. Uh, the initial moments uh, of the war are very difficult for all of us. There's a feeling of uh, just despair because you're going to embark on taking lives and you're going to lose lives of friends, of colleagues, of allies. And so uh, that is a real bummer, uh, the best way to put it. Rather like an election campaign, uh, you, you wait for the first few seats to come in to get a feel for how the campaign's going to unfold. So that next morning was critical. How many of these aircraft were going to come home? It's not that we didn't have confidence, but there was just that element of doubt that had been nurtured by all the negative press, by all the uh, self-doubt that all of us have. I'll tell you, it was tough, those opening moments. To a watching world, it looks apocalyptic. The spectacle seems sufficient for Saddam. He grounds his air force. The fireworks fit the mood of the coalition commanders. A uh, sort of uh, almost festive uh, feeling as you saw that there were losses were uh, exceedingly light, indeed uh, so light as to be almost uh, beyond uh, one's uh, wildest hopes. From the start, the war is heavily censored on both sides. 1,200 Western reporters rely almost entirely on military briefings. The most televised event in history relays little but spectacle. A longtime Middle East correspondent, Robert Fisk. For many of them, it was the first time they'd ever covered a war. They thought it was about victory and excitement and our side winning. It's seen as a kind of user-friendly war. Even in Moscow, once the intended recipient of it all. The war was basically viewed by most people uh, as um, fun and kind of exciting because the way it was shown, the way the military allowed it to be shown. The smart bombs going into holes this big, so the people were saying, they were just saying, amazed. Look at this technology. Boom! Oh, yes! Day two. The euphoria gives way to dread and disbelief as a third world nation unleashes its Scud missiles. I remember when the first Scud attacks came in, it was late. Uh, uh, it was somewhere at 7, 8 o'clock Washington time. Early press reports that these first Scuds may carry chemical warheads cause panic in Israel. U.S. Under Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz. The Israelis came over on the hotline and said they were getting ready to take military action to respond. And uh, we said, wait, we need to talk about it some more. It is the crisis the U.S. fears most. The 
that Israel will enter the war and split the Arab coalition. Egypt's Hosni Mubarak. I phoned uh, Mr. Shamir that. So then be patient. It's better to keep si uh, quiet. This give a good impression at least to the Muslim words. And thank God that Shamir was reasonable at that time. Shamir is also warned that Israel might get caught in the crossfire, would get no special protection if entering the war, reveals Paul Wolfowitz. We did not agree to get out of their way if they did go in. We were flying so intensively over Western Iraq that if the Israelis had gone in without coordination with us, in effect without our acquiescence, the danger of some misunderstanding was quite high. And we had that leverage and they knew it. Day to day, the psychological war continues. At any time, if Saddam uses chemical weapons, what then? And would air war be decisive, or would it rally the Iraqis behind Saddam? With each day, Saddam can portray surviving as winning, at whatever cost. And the cost is to mount. He simply denies reality. Dictators, uh, they're irrational. They won't give in. They won't... Uh concede to the inevitable and to common sense. Saddam Hussein's personality uh, was something we'd studied. He was uh, characterized as being a very strong controller. Decisions were his alone. He has told his troops, dig in, and this US air advantage will pass. He, they had no concept of what modern air power can do and what it's like. We put more airstrikes on him in one day than he saw in eight years of war for him. The airstrikes increased to 3,000 sorties a day. Officially, Saddam himself isn't a target, but the Air Force designed special bombs called bunker busters. The way I describe it is I say, we did not try to kill Saddam Hussein, but we bombed every place he should have been at work. Saddam is shown in a command bunker that's never located, German built, 18 meters deep. From here, he broadcasts daily on the so-called Mother of Battles radio. For him, defiance defines the battle. In all, 40 scuds hit Israel, wounding hundreds of civilians. For half a century, the major powers have avoided this kind of warfare. Now they face their own weapons supplied to a minor power, weapons that might hugely extend the battlefield. General Horner. It is an immense psychological weapon. Uh, we saw in Israel people suffocating because they didn't take the plugs out of their gas masks, dying of heart attacks. Uh, so my problem as the commander is how do I handle this scud? And so the U.S. sends Patriot anti-missiles. This is the air, uh, headquarters of the Air Force. Keep your eye on all sides of the building as the airplane overflies the building. Precision bombing, says the military. The British commander. I was amazed when I saw how accurate the American bombing uh, became. You just virtually might put a cross on the bridge and where you want the bomb to go, and that's where it goes, within a few feet. This is the uh, air defense headquarters in the vicinity of Baghdad. Pinpoint accuracy, the military claims. But smart bombs comprise only 7% of the tonnage dropped. In accepting news management, the media become the war's losers, says journalist Robert Fisk. They broke the trust. They became um, a conduit down which the military could blow and the message would whiz out the other end to the, the reader or the viewer. They became, in effect, unpaid propagandists. I think the thing that we all learn from Vietnam is that you have to be very careful uh, with the media not careful in terms of trying to manipulate them, but careful in what you give them because uh, they will try and make a story. Confounding this policy, live coverage from Baghdad, a factory producing baby formula, or biological weapons, both sides show only what serves their propaganda. By the third week of air war, the targets are dual use, highways, bridges, power, water, sewage plants, everyday life. It's an intelligence decision, CIA Director William Webster. Judgments had to be made in those areas. So that's, that's the nature of war. 
Uh, bridges were destroyed. Uh, other, other things were not destroyed on purpose. Selection of targets in this war uh, was uh, very, very carefully done. Now, that doesn't mean that occasionally bombs didn't miss. War is not antiseptic, but we attempted to do whatever we could. When it came to attacking what you would term civilian-type targets, industrial targets, if those targets had a direct effect on Iraq's capability to fight the war, then they were fair game. Climaxing a month in which stealth bombers attack Baghdad 1,200 times, a shelter is hit, killing 288 civilians, mostly women and children. The coalition says civilians were put in harm's way. General Horner. It was not a mistake. Uh, the bunker itself had the potential to be a secondary command and control agency, and certainly that capability was there. I don't think anybody who went there felt that they believed the story that it was an important military target. The day before, the BBC's John Simpson films a girls' school adjoining the shelter. I think the chances that some, or maybe even most of those girls, were in the shelter when the bomb hit um, are pretty strong. And uh, that seems to me to, be, to have been a, a, a crime as, as e equal to the things that Saddam was doing. Saddam re-emerges, a man at ease among destruction. He has chosen war but does not fight. He has sent his air force into hiding in Iran. He holds back much of his army to keep in power. And still he rationalizes that the coalition fears him, fears a ground war. If he could give the coalition, particularly the Americans, a bloody nose on the ground, uh, then he would have had a major political victory in the eyes of the Middle East. Iraqi forces penetrate Saudi Arabia, capturing the town of Kafji and world headlines. Fire! Saddam needlessly sacrificed his troops, says General Horn. He didn't care whether he lost his entire army as long as he inflicted 5, 10, 15, 20,000 casualties on our troops. Then he could declare victory and go home. In the desert, the Pentagon chiefs and Schwarzkopf confer. There's concern that the prolonged air war is yielding diminishing returns, that it might even help Saddam find support for a settlement. They begin probes for a ground war, but they worry, has Saddam been saving his chemical warheads for this? William Webster, CIA. He did have about 35 of them loaded with chemical weapons. He did not use them, but we thought he would use them. The chemical war, it has to be popped at the right altitude in order to get max dispersion. And it needs a very, very sophisticated fuse, and I just don't think he had it. I would say that he was uh, concerned that it was going to escalate the whole war up to a level that uh, really would not have been acceptable even to Saddam Hussein. And One other explanation that, that many, many think uh, influenced him, uh, there were, the president had issued a kind of warning uh, that all bets might be off if he used any of these things. And he knew we had nuclear capability, and he feared it. What kind of war it might be, only two men know. And in this much, says a military expert, Bush and Saddam understand each other. I really think that there was a secret dialogue between Iraq and the coalition powers. And I think that America in particular would have said to them, to Iraq, if you use go chemical, we'll go nuclear, and we can limit our nuclear attack so that it's not going to be devastating to the rest of the region, and really, Iraq will cease to exist.
Throughout time, the Middle East has been the collision ground for the great religions, empires, and shifting allegiances. Now, as a million soldiers confront here, both sides look to history to claim the higher morality. Thirty-one nations from five continents have sent troops, planes, or ships, however token. Another 18 countries, notably Germany and Japan, contribute non-military assistance. Potentially a coalition about as firm as the sands. Old enemies like the Argentine and Britain, regional rivals, Egypt and Syria, NATO nations and those of the former Warsaw Pact. They are not a UN force. And though militarily 700,000 strong, they cannot lose. They are psychologically vulnerable, culturally uneasy. So the coalition is called a partnership, reflecting the sensitivities of history. Yes, what? Yes. Yes, sir. Last night. Sans uh, vaincu. 120. Outstanding. The French are back, including the legendary foreign legion so deadly in Arab. The British are back, among them units of the Desert Rats, successors to an old stamping ground. Americans are back in action in their largest numbers since Vietnam. The Canadians are back, their first fighting force since Korea. For all involved, melding the coalition is the first battle. The desert unifies them, focusing on a common target, Saddam. Saddam, however, is the distant enemy. More immediate are the cultural contradictions, the poorest nations defending the richest, revolutionary states upholding monarchies, democracies protecting the veil. The solution, segregation. This is Saudi Arabia. 10 million people in a country larger than Western Europe. Most of it is desert. The front line is in the desert, and they were shipped to the front line. And as with even half a million troops, you still could not fill the Saudi desert. Faced with a riddle of 37,000 conspicuously liberated female soldiers, the Saudis apply their peacetime employment policy. American author Sandra Mackey spent years in Saudi Arabia. You still had in operation this same tactic that they had used with the Westerners all along. You stuck them in the desert. You really couldn't sit around and see if the sanctions were going to work because uh, the social tensions in Saudi Arabia caused by that Western presence were tremendous. This alien occupation as much as Saddam's prolonged occupation of Kuwait now speeds the necessity for a ground war. The momentum gathers, surrender leaflets shower with the bombs on Iraqi troops in Kuwait. Saddam gets an ultimatum, withdraw within 24 hours or face a ground war. Mediation ceases. He is alone. Anticipating the ultimatum, he has issued his orders. A scorched earth retreat. More than 700 wellheads are dynamited. Now Saddam's intentions are unmistakable. If he cannot have Kuwait, then he will destroy it. And that's exactly what he attempted to do. force assembled since World War II has been poised, waiting on the high-tech air war, which by itself proves no solution. The British commander. 
I don't think it's altered one thing, which is that at the end of the day, you're fighting a war over uh, a piece of real estate. You've got to have somebody there on the ground. A full month before, early in the air war, the field commanders assessed Saddam's army as largely crippled. We're watching his army being degraded in front of our eyes, unable to withdraw, unable to surrender, because their leader won't let them. The front lines had been attrited down to a point where all of these units were at 50% or below. Despite that assessment, the Allies still hold back, prolonging the air war to reduce ground casualties. The field commanders even get more troops than they ask for. We had built up enormous forces by the time the ground war went in. And there was no question of our ground forces going in till we reckon we got enough to win, and win quickly. The long build-up is to bring questions. Does the ground war begin too late and end too soon? Quick victory becomes the priority. Senior advisor to the British Prime Minister, Sir Charles Pohl. We optimistically, we thought two weeks would do it. Nobody believed that it was going to be a matter of just a few days. Um, the fighting was very fast moving. At the coalition deadline, the huge Allied army uncoils across the desert. The pre-dawn attack stretches across a 300-mile front. 400,000 troops, 3,000 tanks, 2,000 planes, and copter gunships. There's total air supremacy. Victory is assured. It is just a question of when. A combined Arab force, the Saudis, Syrians, Egyptians, feints an attack where the Iraqis expect it, head on. It's agreed that Arab troops should be first into Kuwait City, and assuming a hard fight, they display high morale. The diversionary tactic works. Simultaneously, a massive armored force races west, then north into Iraq itself the British commander. And suddenly he was faced with a highly mobile war maneuver with a massive armored punch coming around and hitting him in the, uh, in the side. And they just weren't up to responding to that sort of uh, the, the ferociousness of the attack nor the uh, unexpectedness of the, of the direction of the attack. As airborne troops cut off the rear, Saddam's occupation army is hit with devastating force. 200,000 armored infantry smash directly on different fronts into Kuwait. Even just hearing it, the firepower stuns. Robert Fisk. And we went about 10 miles up into Kuwait, and I could, you could hear the, the air pressure changing as, as you approach the gun line of this tremendous, um, extraordinary sand that would shift on the ground when the gun is fired. Little resistance is offered. Iraq drastically cuts its losses, holding back entire divisions. There were burning Iraqi tanks, bits of cluster bombs, unexploded shells, and dead Iraqis. And I suddenly realized that it wasn't going to be a war. They'd all gone. Um, the Iraqis had, had just collapsed. In twos and threes, then whole companies, Iraqis surrender. Their condition, pitiful. In the propaganda war, Saddam's troops had been presented as a formidable enemy, battle-hardened from years of war with Iran. In reality, a decade of war, then unprecedented air war, had worn them down. <laughs> Our own forces moved from a point um, way over to the west of uh, Kuwait to a point in northeast Kuwait in a matter of hours. I still don't understand quite how they got where they did when they did. Uh, you, one talks about the fog of war, and it's a very real thing. When the fog clears, the Iraqi force in Kuwait is reassessed at 300,000, far below the Pentagon's original estimate. The prolonged air war had given Saddam reason and time to redeploy primary units, sacrificing the rest in an outmoded trench war. Now ragged, exhausted, Iraqi troops surrender en masse, 65,000 of them. So many, so fast, they besiege the field hospitals where almost all the casualties are the enemy. 
U.S. casualties throughout the Gulf War total 146 killed, 400 wounded. Iraqi troops' losses are unknown. The average estimate is 50,000 dead. In the war's final moments, in a direct hit on a military barracks in Dharan, 28 Americans died. This was the last of 86 Scuds launched. It was thought mistakenly to be the last Saddam had. Until the very end, the media-controlled war has seemed surgical, remote, a daily fix of computer score charts. Now the horrors of war become visible. As Kuwait City is retaken, the official British war artist records his impressions. Breaking tradition, he sees no heroics, just decadence and horror. Finding a toy Mickey Mouse in a wrecked army latrine is a surreal moment for artist John Keane. And it was this grinning, bland uh, Mickey Mouse figure surrounded by a, a, a sea of, of human shit. And, and this image somehow, this bland, smiling creature smiling out over this um, degradation, well, it spoke volumes to me. Driven from Kuwait City, Saddam talks bombastically of a fighting withdrawal. For thousands, it seals their fate. We have to bear in mind that he played a very close, direct and personal part in the conduct of the military war, so he is responsible. The coalition has no mandate to occupy Iraq, where large forces elude them. But now, those retreating from Kuwait are caught along a seven-mile stretch of highway. Mm -hmm. They're still armed, arguably a legitimate target. Saddam could save them, but he chooses to accept terrible losses to justify his policies. With the lead vehicles immobilized, the huge convoy has no escape. Within hours, coalition fighter bombers incinerate the remaining army of occupation. One pilot calls it a turkey shoot. Well, what is a turkey shoot? I mean, we were out to destroy Iraqi forces in Kuwait. And uh, we that's largely speaking what we did. These were the people who had looted and destroyed Kuwait who were now leaving. And they were undisciplined. There were a bunch of hooligans inside Kuwait. I mean, uh, their main interest was rape, looting, and, and uh, stealing, and torturing people inside Kuwait. Even in such dire straits as they were in, they still had to take all their loot home with them. And that was, to some extent, their downfall. So they then became bogged down in the sand, and they couldn't manage a vehicle properly. The termination of the war was a tough, tough problem. You're getting into the price, uh, some people characterize as beating a, a tethered goat. And uh, there's no doubt there was a, we were beginning to feel that. As war artist John Keane portrays it, the carnage reveals the futility of war in the searing image of an Iraqi corpse clutching a looted toy gun. <laughs> Again, it was another sort of metaphor in a way that um, for all the use that they were to them, they might just as well have had toy guns. He's a master of making a balls up. If there's something that you can get wrong militarily, Saddam Hussein will get it. He's no great, he's no military commander. In the course of the war, the coalition destroys, it says, 27 of the 42 Iraqi divisions deployed. The scale and enormity of Saddam's folly enraged the Arab world. Ragida Dergam. Everybody was stunned. So what was this bravado all about? Why were you going all the way and then you were going to be eliminated overnight? Remember that he had left his own soldiers to die on the highway of death. I mean, if there is any reasoning for, to try anybody as a war criminal, this is a good enough of a reason. With no censorship possible, the TV images quickly sway public and diplomatic opinion just as they had when Iraq began its destruction of Kuwait. What the media finally saw. Uh, what we saw on the road to Basra, carbonized corpses, uh, teenage reservists with their legs somewhere above their heads because they've been blown apart, wild dogs, packs of them, tearing dead Iraqi soldiers to pieces, making off with an arm, 
or part of the stomach into the desert to, to consume it, to eat it. War really is the failure of the human spirit. In Baghdad, to the very end, Iraqis hear only of victories. But privately, they are cynical about Saddam, they tell BBC correspondent John Simpson. A senior government official, really senior government official, whom I knew quite well, said, why didn't the Allies finish the war and come up the road and kill Saddam? And more and more things came out about people's hatred of him and their, their desire to, 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 to get rid of him even then. At first, the military does urge pressing on into Iraq, but President Bush decides against it, surprising some allies. It begins the questioning. Britain's senior foreign affairs advisor. We had had no uh, view expressed from our own military commanders that the end was coming so quickly. So naturally, we said, have we really finished the job? Have we defeated them? And the feeling was that we would very rapidly lose the support of our allies, particularly our allies in the Arab world, if it looked as though it was turning into a massacre. To Saddam, the terrible losses seem inconsequential. He presents surviving as winning counting on a harvest of bitterness. <laughs> Kuwait City, March the 1st, 1991, seven months after its occupation. Kuwait's ambassador, al Saba. I couldn't believe my eyes. Most of the buildings were taken over and made into like fortresses. The beaches were dug up, barbed wires, and, uh, uh, mines all over the place. It's, uh, I mean, he had plans to sit there and fight a war similar to the, to the First World War rather than uh, the war he was faced with. The weeks pass. The Emir's palace is restored, now with Filipino servants replacing the Palestinians. The Emir returns. The cost of this kiss. In lives, war and post-war, military and civilian, at least 100,000. In casualties, those wounded, homeless, displaced, at least 2 million. In dollars, the price tag for the bombing and the rebuilding, an Arab study estimates at least 600 billion. There's the cost, unreckonable, of no war, perhaps far greater. But think of what we don't have. We don't have an Iraq with nuclear weapons. We don't have an Iraq that owns all the oil resources of Kuwait. We don't have an Iraq that is intimidating Saudi Arabia and all the countries of the Persian Gulf. We don't have an Iraq, and I'm convinced this is where we would have been in five or six years, that is about to start a nuclear war with Iran or with Israel or with both. Suddenly, as anti-Saddam factions rise up, threatening regional upheaval, Iraq's stability, even Saddam's survival, becomes the new priority. He had to have, uh, be left with sufficient forces to Run, run the country and defend its borders. Otherwise, we were just uh, going to create a vacuum there and might have posed its own problems uh, later on. With a ceasefire, he is seen visibly in control. He survives by treachery. He dupes his adversaries. But no one intervenes. Quite simply, no one has planned for the peace, confesses a senior coalition diplomat. I have to say, I don't think there were very detailed scenarios for post-war. It's a strange thing. Your mind focuses entirely on the immediate objective of defeating the enemy, of getting Iraq out of Kuwait. And exactly what will come after that has a sort of secondary importance. What comes after? Kuwait, an inferno. The battlefield far from still. February the 28th, 1991. On a highway outside Kuwait City, Robert Fisk observes the official moment the shooting stopped. It just stopped through my left ear, but continued in my right ear. In other words, the war went on for the people who had brown eyes, who were Iraqi or Muslims or Arabs. It, it stopped for the Westerners. We were safe. 
Soon after, there's a hurried formal surrender. At this meeting, General Schwarzkopf agrees to an Iraqi request to keep flying their helicopters. This triggers the chaotic peace. The Allies are tricked into believing the helicopter units will lead a coup against Saddam. <laughs> <laughs> a coup Saddam laughingly contrived, according to Iraqi opposition leader Ahmed Chalabi. He sent officers to Jordan who got in contact with their friends and relatives in Saudi Arabia. Iraqis were living there and persuaded them that there was a coup in the making, led by helicopter-borne forces. And as a consequence of that, you had General Schwarzkopf being suckered. Ladies and gentlemen, when we were here, we were 150 miles away from Baghdad and there was nobody between us and Baghdad. If it had been our intention to overrun the country, we could have done it unopposed. If not his intention, it was his inclination. Acknowledging later that Saddam held back 24 divisions, a major threat to the peace, Schwarzkopf says his first recommendation was continue the march. President Bush's former chief of staff on the reason for not continuing. It's not a very exotic reason. It's not a very complicated reason. It's not a very subtle reason. It's fundamentally that the coalition, which was the key to doing anything in that process, said no. The homecomings are heartfelt, regardless of unfinished business. Duty done. Unqualified pride in that. With U.S. troops held back and Saddam seemingly at bay, Iraqis respond to Washington's call to take matters into their own hands. Unaided, Kurdish guerrillas who seize key northern towns now face Saddam's huge reserve force. Robert Fisk. Those troops whom we had been assured by Schwarzkopf, Bush, all the American military machines, had effectively been pulverized, eradicated, largely, were then unleashed by Saddam. Now history repeats on a much vaster scale. Their resistance crushed. More than a million Kurds seek refuge on the Iranian and Turkish borders. It is a desperate flight, mostly on foot without food or shelter, an exodus without equal in modern times. Despite a history of resistance and the U.S. encouragement, the U.S. administration calls the outcome unforeseeable. I don't think anyone could have been prepared for the scale of what happened. I mean, there had been flights of Kurdish refugees to Turkey before. The biggest one, I think, was in 88, when 60,000 people crossed the border. This time, we had half a million into Turkey and probably a larger number into Iran. It, I still haven't even heard an explanation after the fact of why it was quite so massive. Gradually, the magnitude of the Kurdish catastrophe forces attention, but only gradually. The European community is first in organizing relief aid. People, you make a difference. Please, we need you now. National Security Council member Richard Haas recalls the White House indecision. There was some uh, reluctance. There was some leaning backwards, if you will, rather than leaning forwards. But when it became clear, when the pictures came in, when we saw the reality on the ground, when we heard from Prime Minister Major and others and they made their case, we decided to take the plunge. And when we did it, we didn't do it reluctantly. We did it decisively. But yeah, we were somewhat reluctant to, to go into, a, if you will, a different phase of this crisis. By now, the bitter peace exceeds the war in its civilian death and suffering. As many as 2,000 Kurds a day die in these distant mountains. These scenes deeply trouble the American people. As parallel, they mourn their own dead.
now there was death but no war. And what they gave us then was instead of announcing that they were dropping uh, X hundred tons of bombs or, or had made X number of missions, and now they gave us the number of sorties in which they were dropping food pallets. So we got the flip side to high-tech war, which was come and look at us distribute food, come and look at us protect the Kurds. On one thing the coalition leaders agree, they could not have carried the war to Iraq. Even Iraq's victim, Kuwait, agrees. Ambassador al-Sabah. Yeah, I believe that U.S. and other coalition forces would still be in Iraq today, governing the country as an occupying power. Did we want this to happen? I don't believe anyone in our region or the U.S. and others um, were planning for this. History has come full circle. Saddam is needed as a buffer to Iran on what might have been the opposition Ahmed Chalabi. They could have enforced the ceasefire terms, prevent Saddam flying helicopters. They could have said that you cannot move military units at will because you are defeated and you decide how you move your army. They could have encouraged reasonable uh, elements in the opposition to uh, assume uh, control and leadership. Saddam's 54th birthday, two months after the war, is hailed as a triumph. He has promised sweeping reforms, though without an exact date. It is better than war, so they celebrate. At a May 1st rally, Saddam empties his pistol into the air, proclaiming, the people are my protection. Explains an observer, he is there. Without him, they see only the foreigner. Saddam presents the bombing as a holocaust. It encourages feelings of victimization. And this strengthens his hold on Iraqis. During the bombing, it served the purposes of both sides to downplay civilian suffering. Now the UN sends an investigator who knows Iraq well. One came to realize that the infrastructure of the country had received uh, terrible damage and that nearly every major power station had been put out of action. The uh, water distribution, sewage arrangements were totally destroyed. Other independent accounts unmask the drawn out death of modern war. A Canadian doctor, Eric Hoskins, coordinates the Harvard Medical Relief Team. I went into the, the main pediatric hospital. Six out of the 12 incubators in that ward were not functioning because of lack of spare parts. And so what the, the doctors would do is they would wrap the infants in towels. These were premature babies. They would wrap them in towels and put a hot water bottle up against them to try and raise the temperature up to the 98 degrees that it should be, uh, but unsuccessfully. Hoskins makes several visits to post-war Iraq. In the politicized piece, the findings of the Harvard team receive little attention. Its estimate, 170,000 Iraq children may die from war effects. That is three times as many children as soldiers. The UN child agency, UNICEF, conducts its investigation, its area chief. The number of children dying in Iraq went up three times. And it is uh, estimated that 47,000 more children died than would have died a year before in 1990. There was malnutrition as much as 12% uh, of children with chronic malnutrition and um, one in four uh, children in, in Iraq now are uh, under uh, nourished. I saw infants that had uh, uh, pneumonia, and they didn't even have the x-ray film to be able to take an x-ray to make the diagnosis or to assess the, uh, the degree of pneumonia that the infant had. Under the peace terms, Saddam can sell oil for humanitarian needs, but he rejects this as an infringement of Iraq's sovereignty. Overall, 
Iraq's recovery is rapid. Mobilized workers rebuild Baghdad within months. Saddam imposes strict self-sufficiency. Foreign goods are banned. Prices soar, but Iraqis make do, except for the vulnerable. Empty pharmacy shelves, crowded clinics for malnourished children, these remain. It's this point that has been emphasized by the humanitarian agencies, that during sanctions, during uh, civil or international wars, the vulnerable need protection. We need to separate our political objectives from our humanitarian and moral responsibilities. Regardless of the political positions of the governments involved, we have to, to provide those children with their basic human rights. It's international law. The Iraqis must either rise up in revolt, a suicidal prospect as they've seen, or suffer privation, disease, chaos, indefinitely. It would be very difficult for them to move against Saddam anyway. They do feel uh, fear about what would happen if the, uh, his government collapsed, because what they fear most of all, I think, is civil war and anarchy, and they had a taste of that. The peace becomes a war of attrition that may again politicize the next generation. In their classrooms, on their television, war and fear consume them. In describing the war, the kids would generally describe it as being uh, the Bush War rather than the Gulf War. And they actually believed that uh, the President of the United States was sitting as pilot in one of these planes <clears throat> flying around Kuwait and Iraq and dropping bombs. In this war, both sides found the perfect blindfold, television. A controlled media has no message. Two veteran war correspondents. Looking back on the wars that I've written about, I would think that this was the worst covered war since the First World War. There was no military information they couldn't have, except, as I discovered when I started to ask it, about death. Well, there could be no body counts in this war, and there could be no blood and guts, and there could be no horrific scenes. It allowed the military and the politicians to sell and market war as something that did not involve death, but as a, as a political option. And there could be no uh, distressed civilians, and there could be no death on screen. Ultimately, um, television hid death very successfully. What triggered it all, the arms proliferation, remains part of the fog of war. Kuwait, long months into the peace. Its fires rage on, its sands an insanity of half a million miles. A war in which the worst horrors, chemical, nuclear, didn't happen, but were feared. The need to destroy these weapons facilities triggered a major war, and even war didn't do it. The UN had to. The UN field team sent to disarm Iraq find its nuclear weapons program more advanced than anyone had predicted. The first team leader, David Kay. And the Iraqi nuclear program is truly an immense undertaking. Every time I went back, I was impressed, shocked, uh, amazed. They were probably about 18 months away from having enough material for a crude weapon. Shortly before invading Kuwait, Saddam flaunts what he calls the nuclear trigger, imported technology. He has spent an entire decade on this. A military expert on the astonishing aid Saddam received. We're talking of lines of credit of something like $300 billion uh, being extended out over a 10-year period. The more high technology, the more advanced weapons were supplied by the West. The 
basic infrastructures came from Eastern Bloc countries. The Kuwait connection, like a roll call of the United Nations. Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Poland, South Africa, uh, Brazil, China, Korea, Soviet Union, all supplying in weapons. Locating and destroying Saddam's nuclear facilities comes to involve a thousand UN inspectors. It takes years to uncover the true extent of the program. We found a large number of chemical weapons. We found something like 50,000 uh, pieces of munition filled with chemical uh, agents, most, mostly mustard gas, nerve agents in the form of uh, artillery, rockets, bombs. They had something like 150 SCUD-related mi SCUD missiles when the war ended, un unharmed. And the search by UN helicopter teams goes on. So many weapons that war became both inevitable and ineffective. The stunning conclusion? The 40 days of non-stop bombing essentially didn't work. The bombing, uh, I guess, was effective to some degree. It destroyed important production capabilities. But even in that field, uh, the Commission has uh, carried out the more thorough destruction of Iraq's production capability. What makes Iraq, Iraq unique is it was a, a scary situation. If they had not attacked Kuwait in 1990, but say it waited till 1993 or 94, the international community would have found itself in a far more difficult situation. Weapons proliferation becomes an ever greater threat. High-tech war becomes self-perpetuating, suggests war historian Philip Knightley. You couldn't get better publicity if you are an arms dealer than what uh, was shown on television screens throughout the world. And as a result of this, arms sales to the area of swords. One of the most important, com necessary component in any international peace order to get those weapons under control and get this and stop this proliferation and wind it back. I'll be firing in about ten seconds. Roger. High tech war out of control. After the Gulf War, a grim statistic: one in four of the U.S. dead were killed by their own side so-called friendly fire. Check. Roger. Uh, this is forward. Are you ready, lined up? You're ready, do them. In this incident, one of many like it, two Americans died. Now let's take a look at the second one. Got it, This bud's for you. Uh-oh. The war has a clear enough target, <laughs> Saddam. But he alone is not the cause of war. He is the consequence of so much misuse of arms. This is reporting as to maybe friendly vehicles may have been hit over. What? Roger, I was afraid of that. Cease fire, cease fire. The Arab poor, the vast majority of the 200 million Arabs, become the post-war victims. The masses, whom Saddam professed to champion, become the casualties of his actions. The new order, self-security at any price, is stated bluntly by Prince Bandar. Leaders will be judged of first what they do for their people, and second, of what they do to the region. Because if I can't help my people, how can I help you? This is basically the new reality in the Arab world. The new reality is the new vacuum. Years into the peace, US jets remain in the Gulf. But the superpower system is finished. The presence of a single dominant foreign power brings unease. Egypt's President Mubarak. The new world is order. They have only one superpower, no other power against it. Of course, if this superpower has used its power in the wrong way, it will be a disaster. The Arabs are back to seeking an Arab solution, not yet knowing what it is but knowing there isn't much time. Palestinian commentator Rami Khoury. And in 10 years when the Egyptians don't have water, 
and food and jobs enough for their people and they get on boats and invade Saudi Arabia, then what's the West going to do? Half a million troops won't be enough. You'll have to send four or five million. The regimes like the Iraqi regime have no future in the Arab world. Saddam Hussein is a symptom and a consequence of modern Arab history. Uh, individuals riding white horses, promising liberation and a return to dignity. He is a symptom of mass disenchantment, national fragmentation. The Arabs had not come out as victor victorious, not in a bloc, nor as individuals. Nothing has really changed except America as, you know, top cop in the world. That stature is very much increased. That's all that's happened. And there is no new world order. We'd sort of been stumbling along after the war in Vietnam. And I think uh, that lesson was not lost on our people. And it'll allow us, in terms of dire circumstances, to know that we can pull together. Think of what has been prevented, and to me that is the real magnitude of the accomplishment. I believe it will have deterred a lot of other people of a similar mindset. To my mind, the United States will remain the world leader. Uh, and I certainly desperately hope that will be so. But let's be clear, this has not altered America's place in the world radically. It has not altered the Middle East. It's restored the status quo. Kuwait, equated with global freedom, also holds elections. It's first in six years. Out of its 600,000 citizens, only 81,000 are eligible to vote. When you witness all of that and try to reflect back on the Gulf War, the Gulf War looks more and more like a, like a sideshow, like an interlude, like, uh, like an intermission, like, uh, like an irrelevancy. Uh -huh. The bottom line is um, too much mess got left in the room after the party, and nobody seems to want to remember the night before. And so America would vote. The very completeness of George Bush's war would, in a sense, defeat him, contrasting with his seeming domestic indecisiveness. Baghdad, of course, sees it as vindication, though the dancing in the streets is muted. A war that had gained them nothing, nor perhaps their enemies. The final irony expressed by the Kuwaiti ambassador. Who's going to replace the Saddam Hussein? Many people say, well, we cannot get worse than Saddam Hussein. But we've said that before, right? The Gulf War, perhaps aptly named, a paradox. An age of instant communication, yet no dialogue. A media fought war. Victory, technologically preassured for one side, mythologically for the other. It became television theater with all the world as witness and set the nature of modern war. The makings of it blurred in the speed of it. You know, I'm crazy about Kakadu. It's full of the most incredible wildlife. There's nothing like a tour of the galleries or just lying in bed. But you'll never, never know if you never, never go. See the never, never now. These summer holiday brochures are full of great Northern Territory summer specials. Prices start from as little as $348. Call 131688 for your brochures or contact your after or licensed travel agent. Thank you.
Missing an SBS program you consider essential viewing can be very frustrating. If you didn't see the last episode of The Civil War, the SBS special on The Republic, or last week's match of the day, or if you want an informative insight to this month's SBS program lineup, Aerial Magazine is your complete guide. For $42, subscribe for a full year. Aerial, the SBS television and radio companion. Phone 00551610 and subscribe now. Benetton, hailed as one of Europe's most successful companies. The word Benetton means to me sort of boring, slony, bright coloured jumpers. Um, lots of Stone Rangers wore in the early 80s, and it means iconoclastic advertising. The controversial posters have become more famous than the products. I, I think you've got an intelligent group.